revolutionary greetings and revolutionary salutations to you all our viewers and listeners living and working in different parts of the world my special guest today is a distinguished professor of economics and is currently the director of the africa development program here at the university of massachusetts amherst he has published widely on the topic of capital flight from africa and much of his works can be accessed on the links that i'm going to paste in the description panel right in the upload for this video and in the comment section on our facebook page professor leon welcome to the show thank you very much for the opportunity to be with your with your listeners i'm uh, very happy to be able to talk to you congratulations on being named uh, a 2021 andrew Carnegie fellow by the Carnegie corporation of new york thank you so much i have i was uh, was a big honor i'm humbled and pleased to be able to be selected as one of the the uh 2021 andrew carnegie fellows i was much more fascinated by the fact that you are the first university of massachusetts amherst faculty to be named an andrew carnegie fellow i i heard that i just got to know that when the the announcement was made that is wonderful uh, keep up doing the good job. We look forward to hearing more uh, from you in terms of research, in terms of publications, in terms of knowledge production generally in the field of economics. I understand that um, you, you, you previously served as a member of the United Nations Committee on Development Policy and also as a director of operational policies and research at the Africa Development Bank and chief of macroeconomic analysis at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Can you take us through this journey for you, how it helped shape your interests and your insights? Thank you very much. Yes, I have been, uh, I was fortunate to be able to work for um, uh, major uh, institutions that are, in, that are involved in, in, uh, in uh, development. Uh, starting from, from with uh, the United Nations, where I worked in, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, as a um, staff of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, that, so that's the, the uh, uh, part of the secret UN Secretariat that coordinates the work of the UN in Africa. And I was in charge of the section that deals with macroeconomic policy. So our role was to do economic analysis on on development in Africa or regarding um, all major economic development issues and also preparing uh, documents that were, uh, that, were, that were discussed at the, at the key um, uh, meetings by, by, development poli by policy makers, including the ministers of finance and economic development that happened once a year. So the reports that were submitted by ECA were provided by my, my division and my, my section. Um, then I was also happy, lucky to be able to work for the African Development Bank, first as a director of research uh, and then as a director of, uh, of development uh, uh, policy, uh, operations policy. And there, again, I continued to lead the work on applied research in, in Africa, producing stat statutory reports such, such as the African Economic Outlook, the African Development Re uh, Report, and there we really uh, dealt with emerging issues as um, expressed by the policymakers, by the analysts, by the public, including issues on agriculture, uh, finance, financial systems, uh, environment, uh, energy. And then when I moved to the, to the, to the uh, operations policy, I was there in charge of uh, preparing new or revising exis existing operational policies. These are guidelines that help Afri uh, the African Development Bank intervene in African countries. So, for example, we developed a, a, um, a strategy of the, for the uh, energy sector. We did a strategy for the financial, for the financial sector, uh, a policy on poverty reduction, and those guide the, from a long-term perspective what the government, the, the central, uh, the African Development Bank should be doing to help African countries develop. And then when I came back, I was uh, nominated as a member of the, the United Nations Committee on Development Policy, which is a, um, a body made of um, world-renowned uh, experts on, on development from all countries, members of the UN, um from academia from from policy 
who uh, basically work for the the commission of uh, the, the the main body, what we call ECOSOC, Economic uh, Com Com Commission of of the uh, of the UN, which is made of all all um, member states, uh, and it helps that the secretariat to guide the deliberations on major policy issues. So, for example, they are the ones who help the UN determine the graduation uh, criteria when countries graduate from least developed countries to, to middle income country and, 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 so, and so on. But also we worked on special, or special topics. So for example, I was involved in work on, on taxation. Uh, because as you know, right now, the, there is a lot of interest in figuring out how African, how developing countries and developed countries can mobilize adequate tax revenue to finance development. And the concern is that the, there is really no, um, no existing international body that, that, that governs taxation around the world. Because when it comes, for example, to trade, you have the, the, the World Trade Organization, which helps um, uh, coordinate the dialogue and rules and, and, and the procedures about trade. When you have, when, when it comes to finance, you have the International Monetary Fund, which is in charge of figuring out how to keep the, the global financial um, uh, stable, working with, with member countries. We have no such organization for with, with regard to, ta to taxation, and the problem is that then you have a very disparate, heter heterogeneous set of of tax policies across countries. Some countries have a fairly well um, uh, organized, organized tax system that induces uh, mobilization of, of, ta of taxes and minimizes tax evasion. Whereas you have other countries that actually pay charges, charge no taxes on certain activities, which allows companies to basically game the global system in such a way that they are able to establish their businesses and their, their affiliates, their subsidiaries, in a way that allows them to minimize the overall tax, tax uh, uh, payments that they, that they are liable for, because they are able to register some activities in countries and territories that, that, charges, that charge no tax or very little tax, and then other activities in, in countries that charge normal, normal taxes. So you will see that the countries, the, the companies are able to do what we call base erosion through profit shifting because they are able to register the biggest sales and profits in territories that do that charge very little taxes and register very little revenue in countries that charge normal taxes so in the end they pay very little taxes and the way they do that is using their own affiliate their own branches so for example you have a big corporation that has their, their tight IT branch located in a tax-free country. And what they will do is that to have that IT section charge a big, a huge bill to the corporation so that many, a lot of, a lot of expenses are going to be registered there. So, you uh, uh, so that, so uh, so that that if the agents if the IT IT section is registered there, it will send a tax to a branch in Nigeria, which in that branch in Nigeria will end up with no profit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas the profit is registered in Bermuda, Netherlands, and the countries that that have very low ta low tax ta 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 taxes, and because they don't pay taxes there, mm -hmm. they have a huge net profit. And because in Nigeria they have no more taxes, but this company will, will show no revenue at all, no 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 benefit. So they pay no taxes. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem with not having any coordination in terms of international corporate taxation. And that's why uh, I'm now a member of the international um, uh, of the of the, the the independent commission on corporate uh, taxation on reform of corporate taxation, which is called ICRICT. Mm -hmm. And what we do is try to, to, to push the debate on how to, to achieve a fair tax system where corporations pay their fair, their, fair, their fair share and so that 
countries can mobilize enough revenue to pay for development programs and also remove these this unfair uh, situation where you find that big corporations pay less taxes than small and medium enterprises and they sometimes they pay a le less effective tax than you and i who own a salary so because as a salary earner my taxes are taken at the source which is which is fair but then for corporations they're able to game the system and cook the books so that they pay very little taxes that's not fair you have you have we have published widely on this topic of capital flight from Africa. And interestingly, uh, a June 2018 report by the Political Economy Research Institute uh, here at the University of Massachusetts, which you also happen to be uh, a co-author of, uh, examined capital flight from 30 African countries between 1970 and 2015 and documented losses of approximately $1.4 trillion dollars over the 46 year period. And this amount far outweighs both the stock of debt owed by these countries as of 2015 that was put at $496.9 billion, as well as the combined amount of foreign aid all the countries received over the period, which is $991.8 billion. These are staggering figures uh, that clearly show how much the continent is losing. But now, my first question for you, I really want you to, you know, give a breakdown of this. What is this thing that we call capital flight and what causes it? For a, quite a while now, since the second half of the 90s, I have been involved in looking at the, uh, the issue of capital flight uh, from Africa specifically, but it's not a problem that's just uh, for Africa, but other countries, other continents also suffer the, the same phenomenon. Uh, capital flight is basically the, 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 the situation where you have money, funds leaving a country without being registered in the official statistics. This is the case where, for example, money is transferred from a country in Africa to a private bank in, a, in, a financial, in, a, in an off offshore financial center or a, any, any bank in, in European, American, um, and other, 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 other banks without being registered at the central bank, without being registered as an outflow of either investment or saving, because every African has the right to invest abroad. They have the right to save abroad, except that they have to do it following the rules. So if you want to invest abroad, if you want to create a company, if you are from uh, Z Zimbabwe and you want to create a company in or an affiliate in, in South Africa or in, in, in Europe, you go to the central bank, you get the right papers and you declare how much you're going to invest abroad. And then at the end of the year, you have to declare the profits that you have made so that you can pay taxes. Many times we find that some money leaves Zimbabwe, leaves Burundi, leaves Togo, leaves, leaves uh, Ghana, all the old African countries without being registered at the central bank, without be leaving any trace of that money having, having exited, uh, uh, exited, exited Africa. And that money comes from many sources. Some of it is uh, revenue from exports, export earnings that get embezzled by the people who are in charge of managing it. They could be private uh, companies, private individuals, they could be government officials. Uh, it could be money coming from the uh, from the loans that are being being borrowed by by the government, which are supposed to 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 build roads, build schools, and 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 finance all kinds of development programs. And then part of it is 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 basically stolen by those who are in charge of managing it, and it takes its way back to uh, foreign banks without being registered by by the central bank. So one way one one sources of one source of capital flight is this manipulation of foreign exchange that has come into the country through exports, borrowing, foreign direct investment, and gets shipped outside of the country in briefcases, all kinds of, uh, of, of uh, opaque channels of, of transfers without being registered at, 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 with, the, with the national authorities. Another source is the manipulation of, of exports and imports, which we call trade misinvoicing. i give you an example. It, one is export under invoicing. So 
an exporter from an African country is exporting, say, copper, gold, coffee, cotton for 100 million. They are supposed to receive the 100, 100 million dollars in, in dollars or euros, whatever foreign exchange they are, they are using, and surrender that amount to, to the central bank. And the central bank would give them the equivalent of in, in the local currency and put them in on, the, on their bank account. Many times what we see is, and the, so if that happens, you'll be able to see that what the, the, expo, the African exporter is declaring at the central bank matches what the buyer, the importer, what has, has received in Europe, America, whatever, whatever the, 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 the products were sold. Mm -hmm. And we were able to, to match those, those receipts, the sales and the receipts. Should, should match, uh, accounting for, for the cost of transporting the goods from Africa to the, to, to, to the, to the international market. Mm -hmm. But many times we find that whereas the buyer registered that they, they actually uh, received 100 million worth of goods, mm -hmm. we find that the African exporter registered, say, 60, 60 million. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder, what is the rest? Mm -hmm. That means that they will only show the central bank 60 million mm -hmm. and the rest will be packed abroad mm -hmm. because then they can use it for their own well, to, want to invest, want to consume, want to buy other goods, which they're not, 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 not going to declare. That's an, a process by which money leaves Africa without being uh, recorded or the revenue that Africa should earn disappears in private, uh, private bank accounts without being declared by, 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 by the, the operators. It, it, this happens also on the import side, where if, because the central bank requires people to go in and, and, uh, and, and uh, receive and actually apply for foreign exchange to pay for their import bills, what we find is that there is also a mismatch. An African is, is, is saying to the central bank, that they are importing goods worth of 200 million. But then when we look at the, 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 the sources where they bought those goods, they're worth only 150. So why did they, did they tell the central bank that they needed the 200 million when they're actually going to pay only 150? That allows them to acquire hard, hard foreign exchange and pack it abroad. Mm -hmm and buy whatever else they want not to, de to declare to the, to, the, to the central bank. That again, money is going to be flowing to the, uh, to outside of the country without being declared. So export misinvoicing is a huge source of capital flight, along with the embezzlement manipulation of, of, of resources that came, that came to the country. That's what we call capital flight, where money leaves the country without being de declared because people want to get access to undeclared foreign exchange, want to hide the sources of their enrichment, where they found that money. This could be that somebody earned money through uh, illegal, illegal activities like, uh, like money laundering, trafficking, and so on. So they are not going to tell the central bank that, oh, I just sold uh, drugs for 500 million. No, they don't want to tell that. So mm -hmm. when they get money that's from illegal, illegal activities, they will find a way of getting it out of the country without telling anyone. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The other is people may not want to pay taxes on the profits that they will eventually make abroad. Mm -hmm. In this case, they want to ship the money abroad without nobody knowing, in which case they will be able to place the money in a bank or in a, in a, in a real estate or in a, a variable uh, goods and then at the end of the year, they will not have to declare anything to the central bank because they invested without, without, without declaring that, that revenue. So you have basically now, through capital flight, Africa loses multiple ways. One, the money that came into the country that should have been used for, for development is disappearing into the rest of the world, disappearing, is being uh, uh, invested in the rest of the world. So, outflows are a, a, a loss to the country, but the country in Africa also loses because the revenue, the profits that will be made from investment 
of those funds will not be taxed because they are not being declared. So you have a process of accumulation of what we call offshore wealth, which you own by private individuals and companies, mm -hmm. and is not being taxed. So Africa loses the initial outflow, but they also lose the uh, subsequent potential gains in terms of uh, capital gains tax or income, uh, corporate in, in income tax that are not being collected. Banks do uh, play a very critical role in their complicity in facilitating this uh, phenomenon of capital flight. And uh, what are the implications of this? What are the general implications of, of capital flight on issues like wealth inequality? Yes, that's, a, that's an excellent question because when the process we are describing of being able to get access to foreign exchange earnings by uh, th that comes through import uh, exports, get, being ac uh, having access to uh, foreign exchange coming from external borrowing, you can imagine that this is the privilege of political elite, uh, political uh, economic elite. It's not your ordinary African that ha that has access to these massive amounts of money that comes into hard currency. Therefore, the capital flight benefits to those who are already well off, who are able to acquire the money, transfer the money abroad, are able to manipulate the, 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 the legal system and the, uh, currency, the currency control system, the custom system, to be able to acquire money that can place abroad without de de declaring it. Therefore, because they are going to earn that money and all earn more additional profits from uh, hidden uh, assets abroad, that means that they become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. At the same time, the ordinary citizen who depends on government public services like schools, mm -hmm. roads, mm -hmm. um, hospitals, and so on, yeah. are going to see less of those services because the government doesn't has less income from, from taxation to build those, those public infrastructure and public services. So the gap keeps increasing because between those who have and those who don't have, because less services are being built by the government. But also, mind you, those who are able to expropriate national resources directly, indirectly, through corrupt practices, are able to actually source those social services like education and health abroad. Mm -hmm. They can send the, the children abroad to study, to study mm -hmm. here at UMass. Welcome, mm -hmm. welcome, welcome them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they can also come to the US, to Europe, to get medical treatment. Mm -hmm. Your ordinary citizen will not be able to do that. Yeah. So again, the gap increases, first of all, because income gap rises, because on the top, income is growing faster than on the bottom, but also deprivation from social services because of the shrinkage of government resources that, put, uh, resources that, are, that are needed to, to build public, public infrastructure and social services. So in a nutshell, uh, capital flight contributes to increasing inequality, both within the country because it benefits to the people at the top, and disenfranchises those at the ordinary citizen, and especially those at the bottom of the income scale. But also, from a global perspective, it actually has impact on inequality between African countries and the rest of the world, because African countries are going to keep to, to grow slower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as money is being is, is leaking out of the country so the gap increases it ge increases the, the gap between african economies and the rest of the world increase in terms of because of the, the inability to catch up but at the same time if you look at the private side in fact maybe the inequality between african private uh, wealth and the, and the rest of the world could be lower because there is a lot of wealth that ha we have that is not e e taken into account when we look at African wealth versus foreign wealth, because the wealth that's hidden in offshore fi financial jurisdictions uh, is not counted. So maybe African private uh, wealthy people are wealthier than we know, than we know in the numbers, because there is a lot of money that's hidden in the offshore financial centers.
Uh, what measures can international organizations, uh, and including independent countries, both in and outside Africa, do to, to try to curb this uh, phenomenon of capital flight? Uh, you know, you've worked for the Africa Development Bank, you've worked for the United Nations, and you, I'm sure you have so much insight than the ordinary person about how to effectively manage uh, or effectively reduce uh, this phenomenon of, of, of capital flight. What measures have been put in place to try and curb this? Have they been effective? If yes, how and if not, why? What is really uh, encouraging is that the, the topic of capital flight and generally illicit financial flows, which is a bigger phenomenon because it, inclu it includes, um, let me just one second to, 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 to say what the difference is between capital flight and illicit financial flows. Capital flight, as I said, is hidden outflows of resources from African countries that's not captured in the official statistics. But illicit financial flows are bigger because they include flows which either are illicit because they originate from illicit activities, they are illicit because they were transferred abroad uh, in a hidden illicit uh, manner, but they are also illicit because they were, uh, the, the, the money is hidden abroad and not declared. That could include um, flows which are actually recorded in the official statistics. Imagine somebody who's involved in illegal trafficking, drugs, human beings, uh, timber, animals, and so on, and they acquire millions of dollars through those illegal activities. They can launder that money into the banking system in Zimbabwe, Togo, Burundi, and so on in their national, in their, in their national financial system, mm -hmm. in which case they can then legally transfer it, transfer it abroad. Mm -hmm. When they transfer that money abroad by declared in, at the central bank, we will not count that, will not capture that as capital flight because there will be no mismatch between what comes in and what, what goes up, what goes out. But it's illicit because it was originated from illegal activities. So illicit financial flows are much, much bigger than capital flight. Now, the good, the good news is that there, is, there, seem to be, there has been more attention being paid and awareness on the issue of capital flight and its financial flows in Africa and, and globally for several reasons. One, because of the research that people have kept doing, including ourselves and other institutions such, such as the Tax Justice Network, uh, the global, global Financial Integrity in, 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 in Washington, and um, other African Economic Research Consortium in Nairobi, where I did, um, I, I did some, I, I, I was I contributed to some research that produced some, uh, one of the books on capital flight that we have done. Um, uh, so people are now able to read about the extent of capital flight. The other thing has been bringing in policymakers to pay attention to those, the issue of capital flight, starting with the, 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 the United Nations in the, courses, in the context of the development uh, discussion of uh, development financing has been able to integrate the issue of capital flight, illicit financial flows, and, and the corporate tax evasion as an issue that hinders the, the progress in, in mobilizing development resources. And for, uh, through very detailed and um, uh, concerted efforts, the UN now has adopted a resolution uh, a, a target through the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, uh, a target number 16.4, which is to curb the illicit financial flows along with uh, illicit financing of, of, of arms and, and, and terrorists. So people have now understood, understood that capital flight, illicit financial flows are a major hindrance to financing development. They are also a source of, is, um, of insecurity because these illicit financial flows can easily finance terrorism and other illicit activities. So, and then in Africa, the, the UN Economic Commission for Africa, the African Union have our own board and they are leading a very uh, steady debate on how to deal with illicit financial flows, capital flight, trade misinvoicing, uh, corporate tax evasion in Africa. The ECA has uh, uh, put together a high-level panel on illicit financial flows chaired by 
former president of of, uh, of South Africa, Tabo, uh, so His Thank Excellency you. Thabo Mbeki. Yeah, yeah. And this is leading the debate in country about how to identify these issues, how to measure it, and how to to what kind of strategies to 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 uh, to, uh, to address it. Some stra strategies to address it have to be both in Africa and coordinated between African strategies and mm -hmm. global strategy, because mm -hmm. you, you will, we will not be able to stem capital flight if, unless the rest of the world cooperates, mm -hmm. because in the end, the money is not in Africa. Exactly. The money is abroad. Yeah. So we need cooperation from national governments in the, abroad, in Europe, in, in, in the US, in Asia, and everywhere else, especially in those secrecy jurisdictions, to enforce the rules about uh, this, uh, about responsible lending and borrowing, mm -hmm. about open and transparent banking systems, because in the end, this money is hidden in banks, and the banks should follow at least the, the rules that are on the books, including know your customers. This is something that we teach finance students in the first course, that if you, are, if you run a bank, if you are the teller, and somebody brings you a hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. you should ask, who are you? What is this money for? Where did this money come from? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can't answer those basic questions, don't take the money mm -hmm. and report the, the, the attempt uh, deposit to oh, the authority. Exactly. Authority. Mm -hmm. So the other is once you have registered the, the, the resources in the, in, in the customer's account, you should report openly to your authorities as you do the, the annual reporting. So what is, happen what is missing now is open reporting of financial transactions and trade tra transactions as well to national authorities in Africa and the rest of the world. So one of the, of the, of the key ways to move ahead would be to agree on automatic exchange of information between African countries and their partners in the rest of the world about banking, trade, and investment mm -hmm. systematically so that African governments know how much money is coming into the country, how much money is going out, out of the country, out of the country how, yeah. how much money do African countries have in foreign countries. Because as I said, Africans have the whole, the, the, the right to invest abroad. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem. But African, com uh, African companies and, and individuals have the responsibility to declare their investments in their own countries. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. banks in, 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 in the rest of the world, in the West, have the responsibility to, to disclose and report investments, bank accounts uh, owned by Africans, whether it is corporations or, or, or individuals, to African countries as part of this automatic exchange of information. So the, the only thing that will make, dif make a difference is improved transparency and accountability in the banking system and the trading system. Uh, the, trading, we have the trading system, one of the issues we have is that some of the, sometimes when you look at the, many times, when you look at the trade statistics between African countries and the rest of the world, it's very hard to reconcile the value declared by African exporters and the value declared by, reported by the Western importers. I'll give you an example. If you look at your neighbor, Zambia, one of the biggest producers of copper, mm -hmm. if you look at the trade statistics of, for copper, mm -hmm. they are, it's like a, a labyrinth. You can't mm -hmm. make sense of it. Zambia, in Zambia's books, Switzerland is the first buyer of Zambian copper. Mm -hmm. When you look at Swiss books, there is absolutely no import of copper from Zambia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what's not, what, I mean, the, the, the reality is that one of the biggest buyer and operator of, in the copper industry happens to be a Swiss company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So why is it that the books prepared by Zambia do not match with the books in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Why is it that companies that buy copper or any other goods in Africa will not declare all the different uh, ch chain of, of transactions 
that go from buying the good in, in Africa to selling the final to the final destination. Because people say, now, as, as uh, people who are listening to me, there are some, some um, ab uh, um, advocates of free market uh, systems that yeah. you shouldn't ask companies how they do how, it. Yeah, exactly. They will call it interference and interference. too much restriction. But yeah. then I'm saying, if you don't have anything to hide, why, are why you not? Concerned? Yeah. <laughs> why are you concerned? Because in practice, uh -huh. it's a matter of fairness for Zambia to know the true value of copper in the international market. Mm. How do you know the, the value of copper unless you know the final price? Because if I want to know the value of Ethiopian coffee, Kenyan tea, Burundian coffee in the international market, I look at the final price of a cup of coffee, of a kilogram of coffee. But if I don't know who buys the coffee, I cannot tell who is, what is the price of, what's the final price of coffee, which means that there is no way Burundian growers will know whether they are getting a fair price. Unless you know the whole chain of transactions on, on Zambian copper, you cannot tell me whether Zambian producers of copper are getting the right price. That's why I think this opacity on trade of commodities is a big, big problem for African producers. Sure thing. Uh, viewers and listeners, this was Professor Leon Dikumana. He is a distinguished professor and director of the Africa Development Program here at the University of Massachusetts. And much of his works on capital flight is published widely on, on the topic of capital flight from Africa can be accessed on the links that I'm going to paste in the description panel on the upload for this video and on the comment sections on our Facebook page. Professor Leons, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for the opportunity and greetings to your listeners and I would welcome any questions and comments and suggestions because this is an evolving topic. We want to hear from the public. We want to, to be able to do more. That Thank is you very much. That is wonderful. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you.